All right, so why don't we dive in anyway. Uh, so quick question for me about participants here. Who's, who's here who's worn a product manager badge sometime in their career? A couple, how about product owner? Okay, anybody make those careful distinctions? I I'm going to. I'm going to make the case that in fact the jobs are similar and overlapping but not the same. Um, and mostly because I'm going to be talking about this weird thing called revenue. Uh, all right, um, just the, the quick background for me. I've been uh, working in the Valley here building software for business customers since steam-driven computers. Anybody who remembers when COBOL was still roaming Cupertino, I was writing it. Um, uh, tandem computers back in the day, Sybase when it was young, a bunch of B2B startups. Um, I've been one foot in the agile world and one foot in the product management world since about 06. So struggling with the problem of uh, all the agile books tell us that product owners are one thing, but in order to ship revenue, we've got to do a different thing. So that's where we're going. Um, four quick things. One is scope the discussion because I think that's going to be useful. I'm going to try to make the case that the two things are similar but not the same. Uh, if anybody thinks I've missed that point by then, just stop me. Uh, a couple of failure modes, and then I have some organizational maps. So I'm trying to draw the pictures of how you piece this together so you can actually get it to work because there's basically failure modes on both sides. Uh, so let's jump in. And usually the way I think about this, uh, so here's a little diagram of where we are in our cycle. So the far left side, I don't know if you can read it, pre-dollar startup. So this is the lean startup, six folks eating ramen noodles, staying up all night, hoping to be rich and retired by next Friday, right? Um, and then we have products, and we have bigger companies that have portfolios of products, and then we have much bigger companies that have business units full of portfolios full of products. Um, uh, top here is we make technology for money directly. We're in the software business, we're in the hardware business, we're in the technology consulting business. Who's in one of those? Okay, a couple. The bottom is we're effectively a cost center helping the rest of the company do its job. We're not in the business of selling code. And when I uh, draw a couple boxes in here, the very tip of the wedge here is what everybody's reading when they're reading their Eric Reese book, right? It's not the rest of the chart. Right? And I draw a line here that says when you hit between 15 and 30 folks in your company, um, that lean startup thing is insufficient and the organizational problems will override you. Uh, I consult mostly to software companies and I always get the call between 15 and 30 folks because the things that worked efficiently around the table when there were just seven people and everybody did everybody's job and the CEO was the part-time product owner and product manager, fail completely and utterly at about 30 people and no more software gets out the door and everything stops because the assumption that we all knew what everybody was doing on every phone call fails. So when I draw a box in here for what I would call revenue product management, which is who's the person who's supposed to figure out how to convert the technology we're building into the currency that's supposed to come into the, into the building, um, it starts at around 15 to 30 people. There is no startup of 11 people that has a product manager who carries that title. There aren't enough people in the building, and one of the founders does the job. But when you get to about 30, oh my gosh, right? And the bigger the organization, the more business units, the more they've got to deal with the organizational issues and the tiers and tiers of products and issues. So we're going to be talking about the sort of top half of this. A lot of this leaks down to the bottom half, which is internally consumed software. But I think you guys get to pick and choose as to which pieces feel like they fit and which ones don't. OK, keep going. So I'm going to claim that a product manager is a job title. If you get onto uh, Dice or Craigslist or any place else you're looking for job postings, you'll find thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs in this country for software product managers. You will find very, very few jobs posted for product owners. Why is that? Uh, partly. So no one actually hires product owners. What we do in our companies is we look around and we see who would be a good candidate, right? The job market for product owners doesn't actually really exist very much. And it doesn't matter what I think, but if you go look at the job listings, what you'll find is the companies don't hire product owners. 
they nominate them, they grab them, they pull them from someplace else, which has some very important implications we're going to see. Uh, overlapping, but not the same. And the one whatever per team model, which is great for one and two and three scrum teams, blows apart when you get to 30 or 50 or 140 scrum teams. So we'll take that apart. Um, okay, but regardless of what you put on your name tag or your badge or your business card or the signature line on your email, work's got to get done. And honestly, nobody cares whether you call yourself one or the other if the work gets done. Okay, so let's, uh, I'm going to break this into two pieces. I'm going to sort of give you the down and dirty of what I think a product manager does as defined by the job market. And then I'll take apart a product owner and we'll see where they overlap. So, um, right, we all know about the sheepdog job, right? A product manager is somebody whose job, mostly at a revenue software company, is to think about whole product delivery, not just code, and stuff that's going to sell broadly to large markets full of similar customers, not a single customer, right? If you're thinking about a single customer, you're not doing this job. Um, it's about market segments. It's not about individual customers. That's a big distinction with a lot of internal IT work where we really can stare down or have them stare us down in the meeting and figure out exactly who the customer is or at least who the department is. In the commercial space, there are an infinite number of prospects, most of whom are not going to be our customers. Okay, let's keep going. So this is a quiz chart, so I, got, I need you guys to help me here. So I've defined three sets of stakeholders. Right? I'll put product management in the middle, by the way, not at the top. Nobody works for product management. So there is no reporting relationship. What's the input, if this is an I.O. diagram, what are the things that the product management organization is supposed to provide to the development side of the house? Not so hard. Come on. Requirements. Requirements. Good. How about some other words for that? Specs, Specs would be good. What else? Priority. Priority. Use cases. Use cases. Good. There's a long list of things, and they're all the same, right? Market information and priorities and use cases and MRDs and user stories and backlogs. Those are some of the infinite number of ways we try our best to describe what we think we want. What do we get back? What's the return from the development organization? Features, Features on a good day. Yeah, what else? <laughs> Bugs, yeah. Okay, we get some of those, right? I'm going to call these things product bits. They're not whole, why are they not whole products? Because there's a bunch of things you have to have in order to sell something in the world besides the bits, right? Yeah. So let's ask the question, what do my marketing and sales organization want? What do they demand from the product management function? What's the inputs? Yeah, but more specifically, what are we missing? We have the bits. Can't you just install them? What do we need to be in the market with a product? Yeah, we need collateral. What's on the collateral? Some features, some benefits, right? A description of why somebody might want this thing and marketing, marketing right? What else do we need? Instructions. Instructions would be good, right? Tab A, slot B. How about a price? Okay, you are not selling something unless you can attach a number to it and you know how much you're asking for, right? Bunch of things. Segmentation, who is it for, right? Messaging, features, benefits. Do we have a demo? Do we have a qualification list for our sales reps, right? What do we get back from the marketing and sales side of the world? This is a trick question, actually. What do we get back from the marketing and sales side of the world? Customers? No, we never get customers. Uh, feedback? We get feedback. And what feedback is it? It sucks. It sucks, right? So we get feedback, and we get feedback that it sucks. Why does it suck? I've talked to all your sales forces. I know why it sucks. There's one reason we closed deals this quarter, and there's two reasons we didn't. What's the reason we closed deals this quarter? Right, we have great salespeople. By the way, that's true, right? At every one of your companies, you have great salespeople, that's why you close deals. What are the two reasons we didn't close deals this quarter? Didn't understand the product? Or? Uh, more specifically. The price, didn't the, the price was too high, and? Yeah, the product was wrong, okay? so. In every case, when you ask a sales force why we close deals this quarter, you learn that they're good salespeople, not very useful, and you learn that the product should have had a lower price and more features, right? Why did I go to that trouble? Because when 
I wear my product management hat and I ask my sales organization how to improve my position in the market, what do I learn? Not so much, okay? So it's incumbent on somebody wearing the product management hat to reach over, around, through, down, under, and over the sales force and the marketing force and talk to live customers, prospects, uh, deals we didn't close to get out there face-to-face, mano-a-mano with customers and prospects and find out why they think they bought the product, because by the way, they're right by definition, right? Only they can tell us why they bought the product or why they didn't and what was good about it, and where the value was for those sitting in the last session, right? Um, traditionally, product managers have sat in desks at corporate, right? That's a fail mode we'll see in a second. If you're not talking to actual customers all the time, you bring nothing to this party and you add no value. Okay, third group. There are executives, I don't know about your company, right? Any, anybody dealt with executives? What's the input to the executive team to the big meeting? Progress. Progress, strategy. More specifically, what's the unit of progress in this world? Revenue. Revenue, measured in? Dollars, dollars right? right? Very clear. So, so there's strategies, there's forecasts, there's commitments. This is usually a sales meeting where I'm trying to represent the idea that if they could just fund this next product or project or version, we could bring more revenue in, right? That's what I'm doing. Uh, uh, and I say, we think we can capture this new segment. There's $35 million in it over the next two years, and I need, what do I need? There's something I need in this meeting. Sorry? Approval. Approval for, budget for. For the new project. Yeah, but. Who's in this new project? For people, resources. Right, and what kind of resources are they? Developers. They're developers, right? And the rest of the development team. As a product manager, I'm basically, well, pimping's a bad word. Um, I am <laughs> representing the need for more development organization in order to build the next thing I need, right? In order to fulfill the market. What's the return code out of the executive team? There's only two choices here. Right, good. If they reject, what do I do? Go back and tweak the code next time you go and get approved. And if they accept, what do I do? Get started. Right, and, and I now have a target, right? What's my target? To get started as fast as possible. Because what, what did I promise? To deliver and the number. And the, and the, number I, the number I put on the plan is exactly the number they give me back, less six months, right? <laughs> so I get T minus six months and I get a stack of open recs for the development organization, right? Uh, the point of this exercise is that if there's a person who sits in this chair and doesn't get to sit very much, this person is trilingual, okay? Must be able to speak with the development team in sufficient detail to get something right. Must be able to speak with customers and marketing folks in short, simple sentences. Anybody been in marketing? Okay. Uh, the budget for marketing is no more than three bullets with no more than eight words each, okay? Don't confuse me with any details. And we can talk with the executives about the 18-month plan for how we're going to make more money, right? That's the essential job is to represent all three of those lobes, right? And to hold the pieces together because each one of those groups wants to basically go their own way, right? The executives want to dream of something bigger that doesn't take as much resources, and the salespeople want to dream of a product that solves all problems. And the development team, well, they want to get built, right? So the product management job is one that has three sets of stakeholders that want different, develop, different deliverables, different timelines, different language, but they all need to describe the same intended result, right? Smart people who go into product management move into something else pretty soon after that. I've been in product management a long time, figure it out. Okay, so the other part of this is why is prioritization hard? We just, those of us who were here before spent a good hour on prioritization. There's something special about revenue-driven organizations, right? Which is we pay salespeople to bring in deals, right? Um, how do salespeople get paid? Commission. commission. And the commission's based on? The, the, uh, the sales price. Right, of only the deals they bring in from only the customers that are theirs, right? Um, if I'm a sales, and, and by the way, we hire salespeople for what kinds of skills? What? The product. No, 
No. no. Make a sale. Make a sale and <laughs> be charming. And when the customer doesn't want the thing that you have, what is it that you do as a salesperson? You convince, you persuade, you escalate, you find somebody else in the company who might know the decision makers, right? It's about selling. Now, what happens when I tell a sales rep that I'm not going to deliver that feature that he says he needs for that $10 million deal? Right, to? Right, so we hire sales reps specifically because they know how to manipulate their customers and tell good stories and are convincing and know how to escalate. And then we're surprised when they do it right back to us, right? So the, the issue with the, income, the input, right? We know there, is, there has never ever been a development team that's sufficiently big to deliver all the things that the sales force wants. Never happened in the history of the world, right? Most of them are bad, but even the good ones there will never be a development team that can deliver all the things that the sales organization wants. So we will always be in the situation of conflict between the sales reps for the attention of the development organization, right? Um, I sit in this chair, I know I have to throw away at least 85% of the stuff that comes in. It's never, ever, ever, ever going to get done. So I try to, anybody been to Japan? Okay, so the Japanese have like 99 ways of saying no without saying no, right? We've all been here, right? How are all the different ways I can tell you that, well, it's somewhere in the backlog, which is code for you're never gonna see it in this lifetime, right? <laughs> um, um, and all, all of the people weighing in on this are less than purely rational on behalf of the company themselves, right? Because if I pay you on commission only for the deals that you close, you have tremendous incentive to help me find a way to support those deals, right? So the idea that this is a, an open, equivalent, everybody's going to see the same facts the same way situation is mostly not going to happen, right? So it's um, a lot of trade-offs, a lot of fuzziness about what the deals are worth, right? Um, and if I let everybody put all the features in, I end up with pretty crafty, crappy products, right? We, we've all heard about curating the product, which means saying no to almost everything that makes no sense, right? So there's a lot of saying no here. And so it's a people issue. Um, the spreadsheets and the ranking stuff will never, ever, ever, ever convince folks on the sales side or the executive side that their idea is not a good one, okay? It's insufficient. As engineers, we want to tell people, we, we want to convince them by repeating facts, okay? That's not how arguments get won in the executive suite, sorry. Okay, so um, product management is inherently political because we're going to have to tell people that they're not going to get what they want, right? And anybody who approaches this job thinking it's purely rational, um, well, we'll see what that job is in a sec, which is, um, <laughs> right, uh, if you open the job descriptions, what you find is that almost every company in the Valley is short of product managers. And what they're looking for is somebody who has a BSW from MIT and a name brand MBA and good subject matter expertise and great communication skills, right? Um, and is already a product manager, right? And those folks aren't actually um, mythical, they're just rare, okay? So most of these jobs go unfilled. Um, but you need most of those skills to do the thing I painted for us from before. Okay, let's keep going. Um, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about Agile now. So finally, because I gave us the classic product management thing, let's talk about product owners, okay? Who's read a book that's defined a product owner? Anybody want to tell me what one is? Sets the vision. Sets the vision. Helps, with prioritizing. Helps with prioritizing. Where do they sit? How often? Daily. Daily, all the time, right? So, um, it, and I'm going to skip all this. You know, I had myself a whole little agile chart here. The important thing is, from a product management point of view, um, I have to leave it up to my development team. If they tell me Kanban's the answer, I'm theirs. If they tell me it's a one-week scrum process, I'm theirs. If they give me any other version, uh, I'm their servant on this. I don't get to tell development what their choice is, right? Um, so uh, I work with teams who do both of these and everything in between, right? Um, so let's talk about the product owner. If you pick up the book, go to the scrum.org, whatever, right? Any of the books, you'll learn these things. And I put some stuff in bold, right? 
represents the customer's interest, available to the team at all times, right? Why, why did I bold the customers? Anybody? Okay, sure. Um, company's interests, right? I mean, yeah. So for me, it was the fact that this is a singular verb, okay? If you're in an internal IT organization, it's possible on a good day for you to identify the customer, right? The CFO is getting the accounting system, and the CFO said, this is the person who represents them. That's the customer. In a market space, it is not possible to have a single customer. You, in fact, have multiple segments, and every day you have to decide which segments you're going to not address today. Right? The other thing is, I need to be available to the team at any time. Right? Everybody knows this. What did I just violate? Laws of physics. More than that, remember back in the other chart where I said you had to be spending sort of a third of your time with customers? Right? The laws of physics say you can't be physically with your development team all day long and also be out there throwing elbows with customers. Can't be done. Not enough time in the clock. Okay. The other things that happen though is finally the development team gets what it really wanted out of product management, which is somebody who's there all the time, keeps the backlog, keeps the stories resolves the issues, right? This is actually what development wants. They want product owners, they don't want product managers who keep flitting off to deal with executives and deals. Um, and uh, I'm gonna describe something I call feeding the hungry agile beast with a little bit of analogy here, which is, um, if anybody remembers the steam train days, right? There was a job where you held a shovel and stood in a mountain of coal behind the engine and that job was called, anybody know? Fireman, that's right. The fireman was the person who stood in the mountain of coal and fed the engine, right? And what happens if you stop shoveling the coal? Train the train stops, right. The product owner, as it's lived out in almost every organization, is the fireman, is the person who's there all the time, grooming backlogs, writing stories, accepting stuff, there all the time, right? Never gets to look over the top of the train. For 20 points, What's the name of the person, what's the job of the person who drives the train? Engineer, Engineer. yeah, very interesting. Okay, so um, <laughs> when I draw this same chart, here's what I have. Product owner putting in all the things to development, development bits coming back, and usually there's a couple of what we call showcase customers, right? Anybody have showcase customers? What do we know about the showcase customers? They do, right, and what else do we know about them? They are the two customers in the entire world who love us so much that they're willing to come to all of our stand-ups and critique our stuff, right? Come to our demos and critique our stuff. Are they representative of the market? Not so much, right? These are the two customers who know our products the best, who we love the best, who love us the most. And if we let those folks drive our development, what we get is custom software for the two biggest customers in the world, right? What we've left out is the 10,000 customers who could just take us or leave us, or buy the competition, or buy nothing, um, and who wants something simpler and with fewer options, right? Um, so when I put the pieces together, uh, these are all the things that you need in order to ship a product that wins in a marketplace, right? Where it's not complete, it's a partial set. And the product owner job, as defined in every single product owner book in class, is to work on the feature priorities and the order of delivery in order to get bits out of the system Right? And the product manager job, unfortunately, includes all of that, plus a bunch of things that have to do with the world. Um, anybody been in a place where all of your customers are purely rational and choose products based on the exact features that work on well-established benchmarks without any politics involved? Okay, I'd love to live in that world, okay? The bottom stuff is all about how we sell to the folks who may not be purely rational. And if you're in the software business and you don't do the bottom stuff, well, then actually you're not in the software business very long. The problem is, of course, we love the product owner and the product owner is consumed by the agile process, correctly so. One of the reasons that agile works better is because we're putting more product ownership in. But it's pretty hard to do that in the rest of the stuff. So when I draw out the scope, here's what I see. The product owner, is gonna live mostly here in the sprint level or flow level or Kanban level or story level world. 
and is mostly going to ignore or lose or be distracted from or not be involved in the stuff at the ends where we figure out what product to build and we get it to market to make money, right? And if I take that away and put the product manager job in, what I see is that the product managers are all incented to work on the outside of the problem and not the inside of the problem. And suddenly the agile stuff doesn't work because we don't have anybody who's feeding the process with good customer information and making sure we're building the right thing. What we have here is um, we're going to build the wrong thing twice as fast, right? It's progress. It's just the wrong kind of progress. Okay. So, um, we, we need to figure out a way to, to patch over both of these jobs. Um, so let's, let's look at the failure modes. So the first failure mode is if you've been a product manager and what they did was they called you in one morning and said, by the way, you're also the product owner. Congratulations, your job is now 60% bigger. Don't sleep this year, right? It's a classic burnout situation of we were already understaffed, we added 60% more work, and all of the urgency goes to the team. Right? Stories are due today, there's stuff to review today, there's a sprint today, there's a stand up today, there's a planning meeting on Friday, right? And I've been able to do it, and I've seen other product managers do this for one team, do the whole job of product manager and product owner. But the usual ratio is something more like three and a half teams, right? And if you give me three and a half teams, I can't do all of these jobs yet. I'm too proud to say it, so I don't live so long and they have to replace me soon, right? If I take the other side here, um, by the way, how is it that development organizations, when development organizations pick product owners, what do they look for? What's the job spec here? Anybody? I know I need a product owner. What is it that I'm looking for? All right, we'll just do it, right? So by the way, anybody remember this episode, right? Um, when development organizations choose their product owners, here's what they look for. They look for subject matter experts who can also code and write great stories, right? And they never ask about whether those folks have gone hand to hand with customers and sales forces and partners and competitors. Um, they generally don't understand what I call blocking skills, which is all those soft skills about not letting that idiot sales rep or executive help you so much with a really good idea again that's gonna totally take you off the track and demoralize it. Blocking skills are important and they believe in rational customers which is great, it's just that's not what's out there. So what we get is we get the following failure modes. Uh, we're on transportation, right? Okay, so here's the train wreck, product manager. Um, the product manager fails the Agile team when he doesn't show up, when he's not in the, you know, the stand-ups and the planning meetings and the acceptance meetings, when the stories are old, when the backlog is crappy, when whenever you hear the words, build what I meant, right? That's a hint for, I'm too busy, or I don't understand, or I wasn't there, and you guys are smart, right? Quick question, because um, I've done this survey. What portion of software developers are smarter than their product managers? 100. 100. How do I know? Come on, I'm a market research guy. How do I know? Say that again, what was the question? What portion of software developers are smarter than their product managers? and it's 100%, but how do I know? I ask them, and to a person, every single developer I've asked this question tells me that he or she is smarter than their product manager. It's true, okay. But um, build what I meant is where the product manager gives it up and says, look, I just don't have the time, figure it out, right? And sometimes that works okay, but it's, you know, hope is not a, a strategy, right? Let's take the other side, the product owner failure mode. Why do I have a plane? because it's faster than a train, right? We can get to the transportation disaster under Agile twice as fast as we can <laughs> under Waterfall, okay? And here's the failure mode, right? We have somebody in product owner who doesn't know how pricing works and packaging and how selling happens and why customers don't want to upgrade their software and why discounting is a bad idea if you don't have it under control, right? Who never met a marketing or sales or support person in the company, who doesn't understand the company strategy so we're locally optimizing, right? It's not that we're going to fail to build software here. It's that we're going to fail to build software that sells, which if you're in the business of building software that sells is a bad place to be, right? And this is what happens, what I see over and over again when we take 
random development side subject matter experts who can code and write stories. We tell them they're product owners. We send them off to two days of class. And we don't connect them to the market side. Right? Sometimes we're lucky. And it's good. All right, let's keep going. Um, so, so I painted the problem. It's ugly. Right? So what do we do? Um, let's do some maps. Uh, more, ma more management ish to the top, more technical to the left, more market focus to the right. If you're at a startup or a small company, you only have one person to do this, if you're lucky. And it doesn't matter what you call them, because they have to do the whole thing, right? So I don't care how tired you are, you gotta spend all of your time with the development team and also 30% of your time with customers, right? So I call it heroic, because anybody who's read the, the Greeks here knows what happens to heroes at the end. <laughs> and it's not pretty, but it's a great job while you can do it. Uh, the second chart, by the way, I'll, I'll ship the PDFs to anybody who okay, wants to just catch me afterwards. Um, the next choice is what I call the dysfunctional organization, right? So product owners work for engineering and product managers work for marketing. And by the way, there's no intersection. They don't talk, they don't touch, right? <laughs> this is the worst of all possible worlds, okay? So what are the choices we've got for small organizations? Um, we could go sort of product-wise, so we do this heroic thing for each product, but we've got somebody who's the glue, who's the strategist for the group, right? Who mentors those folks and tries to grow them up. Um, another way we can do this is we can have little pods, one or two folks who are playing product owner and one person who's playing product manager, and they better sit together and talk all the time, because otherwise we're right back in the old problem, right? Um, so let's paint it larger because I, I mostly work with big teams. So here's eight scrum teams. I don't know if they're doing Kanban or not. It doesn't matter, right? Eight theoretically product owners and eight um, uh, scrum masters doesn't work, right? Um, so let's figure out how we're going to assign people here, because by the way, the CEO told me I couldn't have six more product managers, right? Um, how do we decide who the product owners are? Anybody? Answer is... Sorry? Availability. Availability would work. Yeah, you get bad answers. But, right. So the way I usually think of this is, well, what are these teams doing? Right? It turns out in this project, um, there's a couple of what I would call headline features, which is the stuff that Gartner wants to write about. And there's a bunch of performance re-architecture going on. It's mostly heads down. And there's some UI work. And there's a bunch of sort of drivers and connectors and stuff. OK, now we can ask the question. Um, who do I want as the product owner or owners on this deep performance architecture work? Yeah, what kind of senior developer? A performance architect, right? I really want to put a performance architect or two there because they're the only people who understand what these folks are going to do. And my product manager said, well, it's got to run 40% faster. And that's all he knows, right? Um, what about, I have some other ones here, what about on the UI side? Who do I want as the product owner for the UI? Yeah, you'd really like somebody who had some UX experience, right? How about for our headline features? I would probably put a product manager there because these are going to be customer facing, market facing, they're going to appear on the data sheets. How about down here for my drivers and connectors? Yeah, I don't know. I actually picked a, a field at, uh, sales engineer, but I don't know, somebody, right? Notice that I put different people in different jobs because I had different things I needed them to do, right? The other thing they need to do is they, as a group, need to talk all the time. They better sit together. They better be high bandwidth, right? Because otherwise, these all wander away. Right? There's one more step here, I think, which is let's rotate all, let's do a left logical move of all these product owners, okay? Let's put the product manager in charge of the performance re-architecture. How'd that go? Not so good. Let's put the performance architect in charge of drivers and connectors. I think he's looking for a new job. Let's put our SE in charge of the user interface. Not so good, right? If we rotate all these folks to a similar job with a different group, we have the completely wrong solution, right? Why did I do this? Because I'm going to claim that randomly picking product owners and assigning them to teams is probably a bad idea, right? Um, You've got to figure out what you need for those teams. They need to be full time. The I'm going to borrow you 10% and make you a product owner story, not so good. Yeah. 
Right. Agreed. Yes. Yes. Right. And it's very rare to find anybody who can do this whole job. And so you're knitting together, right? Um, you're going to have stronger dotted lines because you can't afford for these folks to go wander off, right? Um, but product manager, whoever it is, is still responsible for it working. You're not as a product manager. You're not allowed to say, "Well, the product owners didn't listen to me, and they were mumble." Not allowed. So product management has to actually delegate, actively delegate responsibility and trust, right? Um, so the takeaways, because we're out of time here, right? So you actually have to have product owners. And they have to be there to do the job and not be time sliced to something else. Um, not a sideline, not an ad hoc, not an accident, not an afterthought. Over and over again, I see organizations who don't put anyone in the job. Not so good, right? Um, on the large projects, it's not enough to say your product manager does everything for everybody for 11 teams. That's a fail, right? You need to think about the skills and maybe pick them and maybe train them and maybe mentor them and maybe grow them into the right things because none of this comes naturally. Right? And what I see you know, over and over again, at least on the commercial side, is we put random people in, bad things happen, and we should have known better. Right? Um, that's me. Uh, I live here in the city. I'll drop a PDF to anybody who wants one. Um, I've got some books downstairs. If anybody can't find those, come find me. Um, and as I said, I spend one foot on the product side and one foot on the engineering side, which means I feel the pain on both sides. Good. I think we're done on time. Uh, anybody for questions? Feel free to bolt for the door. Go ahead. Sorry, the, the, the question you, when you had everybody up on there, yep. you had everyone talking. How does that work when you have that, that one right there? Right. So this one. The dependencies, right? Okay. So, so, so there are massive wild dependencies on almost all these things. Right. Uh, the Scrum of Scrum's model is fine for the engineering side. Think of a product of products model here where we get together not every day, but certainly two or three times a week, because I can't let those teams run off on bad decisions, and we've got to share all the time. Ideal if we sit together, or the product owners sit with their development teams, because better that they're there. Good, anybody else got one? I'm between you guys and drinks, so uh, I'll stay up here for a minute and unpack. Thanks for, uh, thanks for doing that.